Okay, thank you everybody for joining. We are beginning <clears throat> with, tonight we are, not a beginning, we are continuing our Shi'ur on the Shemona Esri, and we are up to the 15th bracha. And this bracha, et semach david avdecham leherat atzmiach, is a bracha for Mashiach ben David. Its nusach remained fairly stable throughout uh, the generations. For at least a few hundred years, we know for sure that this bracha remained very, very similar. The earliest versions in the Karaganiza, and I hope not to be getting ahead of myself, but are very similar. Until today, we have almost identical versions in the in our quote-unquote modern versions of this bracha. Let me just read to you from the from the versions we have in the Geniza. Et tzemach David ata tatzmiach v'kanot harun b'shua techa baruch ata Hashem matzmiach kerin b'shua. Very similar, right? With an ayin taf aleph ata tatzmiach, and then in the other versions we have et tzemach David avdecha mehirat tatzmiach. Sometimes you would add the word ata v'kanot harun b'shua techa, and <clears throat> may his horn be raised in your salvation. Ki l'shua techa ki vinu kolayom. This is an, an added. Me'ena chatima added to the end. It's not in all of them, but it's in some of them. Baruch Hashem matzmiach keren shua. A very stable nusach. And in order to understand why this nusach is so stable, we have to understand its origins. The origins of this bracha, again, for the, uh, the, the language of it, of course, is biblical. We have a pasuk in Tilim, Shem matzmiach keren David arachti ner shichi. We have many times in Tanakh, where the ideas of Matzmiach Yeshua are mentioned. For example, um, I believe there's a Pasuk Ramakani Bahashem Rachav Pi Aloy Vaigi Samachti Bishua Techa. Uh we have a Pasuk that's in that's in um that's in Shmuel Aleph. In Yermia you have uh Beami Mahe Matzmiach Le David Semach Tzedaka. There are more than one uh, allusions to a language like this in Tanakh. And therefore, the language of Etzemach David Avdechamer Atatzmiach is not surprising. The idea of a sprout of King David being an expression used in their time very much comes from Tanakh. How does that word work? And how does that word uh, or that expression work in Lashona Kodesh? Well, we don't know for sure. Uh, it could be that simply in Lashona Kodesh and in similar languages, the sprout means the progeny, or it could mean the blossoming. But it seems to be a prayer that would most likely be developed post Horban, but it isn't impossible that it was developed during Bayit Sheni. But let's look at our earliest evidence. So last week, <clears throat> in order to understand this Biracha, we have to do a little bit of a recap of last week. Last week, and I, I, if you don't see the slides, let me know, but I think you should be seeing the slide, the Tosefta from Brachot um, above. Last week, we discussed the history of the Brachav Bone Yerushalayim. And as we saw, originally, there were two options. One option was to say the Brachav Bone Yerushalayim together with the Brachav at Semach David. And the other option was to say them separately. In Eretz Yisrael, what ended up happening was that they chose to say Elokei David Bone Yerushalayim and make them into one Bracha. And in Bavel, they chose to make them separate brachot. And it's that history that we're going to explore tonight. So let's review the Tosefta. Let's try to unravel and unwrap the different theories for why and how the Bnei Bavel decided to split it into two brachot. So the Tosefta over here says that although there are 18 brachot, Shmona Se brachot Shamru Chachamim, Still, if you want, there, there shall, you could combine, right? You could, uh, what's the word? You could, you could combine the two. But if you said these two independently, you're Yotze. Now, the Tosefta is an early source, contemporary or roughly a little bit earlier than the Mishnah, from Eretz Yisrael. So what this shows us that is that in the time of the Tanaim, in Eretz Yisrael, it was optional. You could do either way and you would be Yotze. However, when it comes to uh, the time of the Amoraim, we see a different picture. First, let's look at the Bavli. In the Bavli, we have Amar Rebbe Bar Shila. Rebbe Bar Shila says, Ditzlota, when we're saying a bracha about David, 
in tefillah. We say, Matzniach Kerin Yeshua. This is Gemaram Psachim Daf Kuf Yud Zayin Amud Beit. I'm sorry if I didn't write it on the top. The Haftarta, but when we're saying a brachav David by the brachav, the Haftara, we say Magen David. It sounds like, at least to my eyes, that in the time of Rabbi Barshila, who's, I believe, a third or a fourth generation Amora, by that time, the Amoraim were already fixing what the Lashon, the, the Hatima of the Bracha should be. Essentially, they definitely had a separate, a separate Bracha for, uh, they definitely had a separate Bracha for, uh, the, for David, for, for Mashiach ben David, but what the exact exact chatima should be was being fixed then. And his his opinion was, by davening we say Matzmiach Keren Yeshua, and by the Haftara we say Magen David, which sounds like there were options in Babel. They didn't all, only say Baruch Atah Hashem Matzmiach Keren Yeshua. They might have also said, some people might have used the, 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 the ending Magen David or Eloke David or something like that. But that's what it sounds like from the time of the Marayim in Bavel. Further, if you look in the Gemara and Dafid Zayin Mudbet in Megillah, you'll find Veheikan Mitromemet Karnam Shel, meaning Shel Tzadikim. Where should the horn of the exalted, uh, of the horn of the righteous be exalted in Yerushalayim? Shinem Ashalu Shilom Yerushalayim Yisrael Vaich, the Kivan Shin Veneti Yerushalayim Ba David. And once we build Yerushalayim, David Amelach shall come, Shinem Ar, Achar Yashuvu, Bene. Uh, and the, as similarly in the Havinenu, I'm sorry I didn't make a slide for this, but, ha, but the Havinenu, the shortened version of Shimon Esri says, That is the language of the Havinenu. So clearly, the Nusach in Bavel, by the time of the Amoraim, was two berachot. Everybody held two berachot. There might have been some question as to what the Chatima was, but it seems that Masmiach Karen le David was the most popular one in Bavel. However, the picture is very different in Eretz Yisrael. In Eretz Yisrael, um, unlike the, the era in Eretz Yisrael of the Tanaim, in Eretz Yisrael they chose not to split it into, into two brachot. We'll see if that's a choice later. But this is what we have in the Gemara in Yerushalmi. Benavi hu omer aloke David matz, uh, sorry, betfila hu omer aloke David ubonei Yerushalayim, benavi hu omer aloke David matzmeach Yeshua. Right, in their version of the Shmon Esrei, it said aloke David bonei Yerushalayim. In their version of the Haftarah, the, the, the Hatima was aloke David matzmeach Yeshua. Different Haftarah, blessing than ours, but still a very interesting source, a very interesting Hatima for uh, Shmon Esrei. So, and, and there's also two other Gemarot, one in Tanit, uh, one in Brachot, besides this Gemara and Rosh Hashanah, which corroborate this fixity. We also have the Havinenu, which corroborate, corroborates this. They simply did not and refused to have more than 18 Brachot for Shemona Esrei. For them, it was going to be uh, combining these two, a Bonei Yishlaim, and also uh, combining Bonei Yishlaim and Mashiach Ben David into one. Now, the question is why? So there's been some speculation in, I should say, controversy in the past couple of decades as to the exact um, reason for this split between Bavel and Eretz Yisrael. So here's one theory. Let's look at the Gemara in, in Sanhedrin of Kuf, Zayin Abad Aleph. The Gemara in Sanhedrin uh, demonstrates the opinion of the Bnei Bavel, and it says, Amar Bihuda, Amar Rav. A person should never bring himself to a challenge or to a test. Why? Because David Melech Yisrael brought himself to a, a challenge and he and he fell. He tripped. Amar Lefanav, he said to Hashem, Hashem, why do we say we mention the patriarchs in in? In Shmon Esrei, we say Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzhak, Eloke Yaakov. We don't say Eloke David. I should be a patriarch too. Amar Hashem said to David, Inu min sulivat lo min titli. They were challenged. You were not challenged. Amar li lefan of Rebona Shalom b'chaneni v'naseni. He asked Hashem for a challenge, and then Hashem gave him the test of Batsheba. What this sounds like is that the Bavli doesn't believe whatsoever that we say Eloke David in Shmon Esrei, but according to Yushalmi, we do. And if you look in the Gemara in Yushalmi and also in the Midrash Shmuel, which is a, an Eretz Yisrael source, you find the exact opposite. 
שובך ש... שהיה דומה לשובך, שהופך שנשפך דומה על הארץ, ועשיתי לך שם גדול כשם הגדולים. says המדרש, מכאן, I shall make your name like that of the great ones. What does that mean? What is Hashem telling David? That I shall make your name just like the patriarchs. מכאן קבעו חכמים אלוקי דוד ובן ירושלים. This is why שמונה עשרה says אלוקי דוד ובן ירושלים. כנגד אלוקי אברהם, אלוקי יצחק ואלוקי יעקב. ובשבת, אף על פי שאין העובר לפני התיבה מסגירו, אין על שבת, even though the person who's davening, שמונה עשרה doesn't say it because we skip the middle 12 ברכות, or 13, המפטיר בן אבי מסגירו, when you say הפטרה, he says it, אלוקי דוד מצמיח ישועה לעמו ישראל. We see again this הפטרה style blessing. Now, this clearly was the... The, the split between the two factions of Klai Yisrael. There were factions in Klai Yisrael who followed the yeshivot in Bavel. And there were, there were groups of people in Klai Yisrael who followed the minhagim of the yeshivot in Eretz Yisrael. Each yeshiva had its own jurisdictions. Uh, let's say the yeshiva in Bavel covered jurisdictions in Iraq, in what we would call today Iraq, northern Mesopotamia. Um, there were areas in Egypt that were under their control, Syria, Teman, Uh, the, in Iberia, I guess that you could call it that at the time, uh, northern Italy, while in Eretz Yisrael, the communities uh, the fo- that followed the Yishibot of Eretz Yisrael and were within their Rishiyot, or their, their jurisdiction, were communities like Fustad in Cairo, um, uh, communities in Lebanon, communities in Eretz Yisrael, communities in southern Italy. Um, even, I believe it was in, what's that island off of, off of Italy? Uh, I'm blanking on it right now, Sicily. Many kilot followed the minhagim of Eretz Yisrael, and it's reflected in the Karaganiza. In the Karaganiza, we find from the community of the Ben Ezra synagogue who followed minhag Eretz Yisrael, we find the old ancient version of Rach, of uh, what's it called? We find that ancient version being used of the combined version. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokei David Bonei Yishalayim, and they simply do not have Et Semach David Meherat HaTzmiach. You look right here, they end Elokei David Bonei Yishalayim in this manuscript that I'm showing on the screen. And then, Shema Koleinu Hashem Elokeinu. Very interesting uh, I, uh, fact of history. In Eretz Yisrael, they simply didn't say it's Semach David. Now, that's beautiful. What happened to them? Well, essentially, the, the Shivot in Eretz Yisrael uh, lost their, uh, fell from grace for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the Shivot in Bavel were, frankly, better supported financially and superior in numbers and superior in the amount of scholars they had. Uh, secondly, some wars between the Muslims and Eretz Yisrael created a very dangerous political su- situation for Jews in Tiveria. And that's where many of the Shivot were, were housed. So eventually, after a pogrom or two, the Yeshivot moved out, and the s- <clears throat> smaller communities that followed the leadership of those Yeshivot, yeshivot also eventually died out and, and began to adopt the minhagim of the Bnei Bavel, which were more educated, more influential, and greater in number. Here's another manuscript I'm showing on the screen of the bracha of <clears throat> Etzemach David. You see here, we have the typical Tishkom Betoch Yushalayim, then afterwards you have Etzemach David Abdecha Meirat HaTzmiach, very typical of the Nusach Bnei Bavel. Now, let's discuss <clears throat> for a second the strangeness of this bracha and the chatima. So there are at least four, maybe five, six, seven, eight uh, opinions about the development of this bracha and how late it was. So I'm going to boil them down to four. And you have four items here on the screen, as you could see. One, that originally at Samach David Abdecham Erat HaTzmiach was a universal bracha that everybody uh, <clears throat> prayed. And however, <clears throat> it was a bracha that, let's say, predates the Galut, already created in Bayit Sheni, and it trickled down to the to the Jews in Eretz Yisrael and the Yeshivot in Babel. Another opinion is that it was created in Eretz Yisrael, and from there spread to Babel, but they lost them in Hag in Eretz Yisrael. Another opinion is that it was created only in Babel, And the last opinion, and believe this or not, is that it was created by Christians in Yerushalayim. Christian Jews, I should say, in Yerushalayim. So let's pick these apart one by one. First, we should discuss the Gadol of Gedolim, uh, the, the first, the, the most, uh, 
what do you call it? The first most important uh, opinion to consider would be that of the Tosafot Rid. He's the earliest. Let's discuss him first. The Tosafot Rid in, in the Gemara Tanit is of the opinion that originally the Jews in Eretz Yisrael prayed all 18 separately. They would say Masmiach Keren Yeshua and the Bracha of of Bonei Yerushalayim. Had, they had both of them. However, Shmuel HaKatan was, was instructed by Rabbi Gamliel B'Yavne a bit later, meaning the story in Bavli shouldn't be taken to be an immediate story. What happened was that later, decades after the institution of the Shmona Esrei by Rabbi Gamliel B'Yavne, Shmuel HaKatan instituted the the Birkat Haminim. Once Shmuel HaKatan instituted the Birkat Haminim, then we had an issue because now there are 19 brachot. So what happened was that in Eretz Yisrael, they combined Bona Yushalayim and Atzemach David in order to get back to the number of 18 because the bracha of 18, the, the number of 18 was important to them. However, the Bnei Bavel by that point were not interested. They weren't Makpid. Okay, 18, 19, what's the big deal? Didn't have to be exact. So from their perspective, Let's do 19. That's the opinion of the Tosafot read. 700 years later, when scholars revisited this, there were other opinions presented. Um, one opinion is that it wasn't because the Bnei Bavel weren't Makpid. It was because they simply didn't say Birkat HaMinim in Bavel. It didn't reach them yet. And it wasn't until later that the Bnei Bavel adopted this uh, bracha of Birkat HaMinim, simply because they didn't have Minim in Babel. Remember, they were under the Persians. It wasn't a big problem. Um, second, we have another, that was, uh, I think, uh, what's his name? Maishi Chernowitz, who, believe, who who put that up. And Louis Finkelstein, on the same vein of this, as the Texas Red, says, no, uh, they just didn't say Bona Yushalayim in Babel. That wasn't yet instituted in Babel. And therefore, uh, that's why they didn't really need to uh, diminish uh, one bracha to get to the number 18. But at Semach David Merat Atzmiach was indeed uh, part of the original core. Okay. Um, that, that's that, that's a, that's an opinion for another time. Now, another, one other opinion is that in Eretz Yisrael, and this is uh, the opinion of Uri Erlach, that in Eretz Yisrael they always had this bracha, at Semach David Merat Atzmiach. However, and it's one of the most ancient Uschaot, but in Eretz Yisrael, they preferred Elokei David Bani Yushalayim, meaning there were two options in the time of the Tanaim. Either do the separate bracha Matzimiach Karen Yeshua or Elokei David Bani Yushalayim. But in Eretz Yisrael, for halachic reasons, they believed it was halachically preferable to combine them into one than it was to have a separate bracha for Mashiach Ben David. That's an interesting uh, idea. Maybe he, Maybe they held... Uh, Elok David should not be said, as we saw in the Midrash, or, or oh, sorry, Elok David should be said together with with Binyan Yushalayim. While in Bavel they disagreed. It could be a halachic preference, but he believes that no, Masviach Karen Yeshua was native to Eretz Yisrael. Okay, um, oops, I ended. I ended that uh, that that share. Let me give me a second to just recreate this uh, slideshow. Give me a sec. Okay. Next, another opinion, and because this is controversial, it just doesn't end. Uh, I believe it was Rup Shlemi Huda Rappaport. Rup Shlemi Huda Rappaport was um, one of the Rabbanim who was in Europe, one of the Rabbanim in Europe who was very pro uh, the scientific study of, of Judaism. He was a big proponent, an orthodox proponent, proponent of the Wissenschaft. And he had a very interesting idea. He says that the reason that in Bavel they couldn't delete the bracha of Matzmiach Karin Yeshua was completely political. Meaning, let's say the Taisus Rid is right. The Taisus Rid says that uh, that Birchas Aminam arrived and now we have 19 brachas. So you have to take one out. So he says the Taisus Rid idea was that in Bavel they weren't Makbid. Okay, 18, 19, what's the big deal? He says, no, it could be more than that. Not just that they weren't Makbid, but in Bavel they had the Reish Galusa. The Reish Galusa was like the president of the Jewish community, not just of Bavel, but of the whole world. 
They had the Gaon, who was the head of the yeshiva and in chief in charge of religious matters. And you had the Reish Galuta, who was like the president, and he was chiefly in charge of secular matters. The Reish Galuta, uh, ever since the time of the Amoraim, always claimed that their family had Davidic dynasty. They were from the family of David HaMelech. They all claimed to be from Shevet Yehuda. They came from David, etc., etc. So politically speaking, how could they delete a bracha on Shmona Esrei that was there to honor the Beit David? They simply couldn't do it. They didn't have the option of deleting the Birkat, uh, the Birkat David. Well, Elbogen, Yisbar Elbogen, goes even much further. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. This bracha is the last one ever created. This bracha was created in the time of the Amoraim. Matzmiach David, Matzmiach Keren Yishua was created in the time of the Amoraim because it was created, created in the time of the Amoraim because of the Reish Galuta, meaning it was there originally in, in Bavel, they said the two of them together but they separated it into a separate bracha for the kavod of the Reish Galuta, meaning Matzmiach Karen Yeshua was one of the last, probably the last bracha that was added to the Shemona Esrei, which is a fascinating idea. I'm not sure how how long in his life he he maintained that position. I'm actually curious. I have one within arm's reach. Give me a second. I, I struggle to believe that Elbogen believed this throughout his entire career, since he did have, uh, there were certain... Uh, brachot that he went back and forth on throughout his career. I think it was, um, let me look here if I could find it. Um, let's see, Benediction 15. Where do we find him talking about Benediction 15? I think it's, okay, I'll come back to this and I'll add a, I'll add a note to the shiur if I don't get a, um, if I don't find it in time. Okay, let's move onward. Lewis Ginsburg had a very interesting idea. In his Pirish for the Yushami, he says that, and he believes something a little bit out of whack that most of the other scholars don't believe. He believes that the essence of the Shemayin Esrei is much older than Rebbe Gamliel B'Yavda, but not just a little bit older. He believes it's like 300 years older then Rabbi Gamliel B'Yavna, Rabbi Gamliel B'Yavna was simply uh, fixing or canonizing the text. So he believes that the bracha for David simply couldn't be said in Eretz Yisrael under the Hashmonai or the Roman governments. Because when you were under the Hashmonaim, who were not Mibet David, or you were under the Roman government who was very sensitive about the, the Jewish allegiances, um, you simply couldn't. Uh, you simply could not have a separate bracha about the Malchut Beit David. However, in Bavel, where they were under the Persians, over there they could have a bracha of Malchut Beit David. And that's why there was a split between Eretz Yisrael and Bavel. So we have a hundred different reasons so far. I hope nobody's too confused. But now we're going to get to the absolute, uh, the absolutely most interesting one. And that is the idea that it was Christian Jews in Eretz Yisrael, in Yushalayim, that, that it was Christian Jews in Yerushalayim who created this bracha. So on my screen here is a picture of the person who first made this trouble. His name was Yehuda Liebs. He's a professor of, of Kabbalah who wrote a very provocative article in the, the magazine was called Merkere Yerushalayim B'Machshevet Yisrael, Jerusalem Studies and Jewish Thought in 1983. He was and still is a troublemaker. He, his expertise is a is as a scholar of Kabbalah, and he's well known for his work on Zohar and various uh, works of the Mikubalim going back from the 13th century onward. And really, liturgy is not his field. Uh, just just to, to to give him credit, I mean, credit where credit is due. Liturgy is not his field. He 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 does have the training necessary to study liturgy properly, but but liturgy was not his field. And he approached this problem of this bracha with a very biased lens. And you're going to see what I mean in a second. You see, the, the chatima of the bracha has always been pondered by the pirushim on Matzmiach Ker, uh, Ker Nishua. All the, 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 the pirushim on Etzemach David are confused by the chatima of this bracha. 
the bracha speaks about Mashiach ben David, but it doesn't end Baruch Atah Hashem Alokei David. All the other brachot Shmona Esrei end with their topic. Um, let's say uh, the bracha of Avot ends with one of the Avot, Magen Avraham. Uh, the bracha of Gvurot ends with a Gvura, Tchiat HaMetim, and it probably also ended with, with uh, the word Gvura originally. The bracha of Kedushah, Hakel HaKadosh, bracha of Dat, Chonin HaDat, bracha of Slicha, Chanun HaMabel Yisloach, the bracha of Rufua, Rofei Cholei Amo Yisrael, the bracha of Shanim ends with Berkat uh, Mevarei HaShanim. Somehow, the bracha of Berkat Mashiach Ben David doesn't end with the word David. Why would it end with Matzmiach Keren Yishua? Furthermore, he seems to have a grammatical issues with it. From his point of view, it's not Matzmiach Keren Yishua, it's mats, that Hashem is the Matzmiach Keren of, Ye, of Yeshua. Hashem is, Hashem is he who raises the horn, the raiser of the horn of Yeshua. The problem with that grammar is that when you say Hashem is the one who raises the horn of, right? Hashem is the raiser, the Matzmiach Keren of, he, that he sprouts the horn of, you would need grammatically a proper noun. You would need a person's name, like Matzmiach Keren, Le David, Matzmiach Karen David, Matzmiach Karen Levet David. And so it would be sensible that the original bracha, in his view at least, was something more like Matzmiach Karen Levet David. He corroborates this from a pasuk in Ben Sira, where it says, Hodula Matzmiach Karen Levet David, Kilalam Chasto. So that would sound like that since Ben Sira had that language, it was probably also an Anusach of the Chatima. Others have, 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 uh, have recommended similar. Um, uh, Chatimot, just like we had by the Haftarah for Eretz Yisrael, K David Matzmiach Yeshua. It was probably something more similar to that, or Matzmiach Karen Yeshua, uh, uh, Matzmiach Karen uh, Le David. I forgot. There's there's a bunch of different uh, opinions as to what it could have been, and furthermore, there is a verse in Luke which I don't know in 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 English, but I'll tell it to you in Hebrew. It says Vayarem Karen Yeshua Lanu Bebet David Abdo. So he believes that originally the bracha was explicitly about David. But what happened? What happened was that the Christian, uh, that the Jewish sects in Eretz Yisrael began to change it because they believed Mashiach ben David was Yeshu. So essentially, because of this inspiration, they modified the bracha. And instead of saying Matzmiach da, uh, Karen, uh, Karen Lebet David, they said Matzmiach Karen Yeshua, because Yeshua is Yeshu, right? Yeshu's name is Yeshua, is uh, Yeshu, right? Yid, Shin, Vav, Ayin, that was the name of, of Yeshu. His name was a, a form of Yeshua. So they're being Maramas. Originally, this bracha is really a bracha about Jesus, and uh, we all have it wrong. We think it's Matzmiach Karen Yeshua. We think it's talking about salvation. But it was really Jewish Christians who wrote this Chatima of the Bracha, and they modified it because they wanted it to be a Bracha about Yeshu. Now, <laughs> there are so, so many layers of assumptions and historical assumptions that it takes to make these mental gymnastics. Um, a lot of it is built, to be, to be fair, on 1983 level data about dating different Midrashim, dating different uh, areas of Tesefta. He has 1983 level information about all of that. And furthermore, a lot of it lives within his imagination. These are a lot of assumptions built upon a lot of assumptions. Now, this evoked a firestorm of controversy and reviews because from the, from the viewpoint of Jewish academics who were reading this in this journal, if they just said nothing to such an outlandish claim, then Christian scholars would suddenly pick their heads out of the woods and be like, wait, what? Did the Jews just say that that they have a bracha that was actually originally Christian? So they had to respond. And Yisrael Tashema responded forcefully. And uh, I think it was Shlomo Marag, Menachem Kister, a whole bunch of people responded forcefully to this. And many of them were, were from Svara. Like, why in the world? Um, why, like, First of all, grammatically speaking, this doesn't make any sense because grammatically it's not Matzmiach Karen, it's Matzmiach Karen Yeshua. Just like we say Karen Yeshi, it's not Matzmiach Karen, it's Karen Yeshua. It makes perfect sense grammatically. There's a lot of arguments against this. But furthermore, well, according to, uh, what's his name? According to uh, 
what's this guy's name? Yehuda Leibs. What happened was that Rabbi Gamliel Biyavna, when he saw this uh, version of Matzmiach Karen Yeshua, he didn't like it. And when Shimon HaPikoli told it to him, he said, you know, eventually when he saw that it was modified, he said, you know what? Or if he saw that the, the Jewish Christians were modifying it, what he did was, is he deleted it and he said, everybody should do a okay, David Bonnie Yerushalayim. However, in Babel, where they didn't have a problem of Christians, therefore, um, therefore they didn't have to uh, combine it and say, okay, David Bonnie Yerushalayim. Over there, they just kept it, Matzmiach Karen Yeshua, not knowing that it was really had it had Christian attitudes in it. In it. So there's oh, of course his svar is against that. Like why would Gamliel be Avna not just change it back to Karen Lebet David? Like none of this really makes perfect uh, sense. But then after all the uh, what's the word controversy and all of the forceful responses for everybody telling him he was out of his mind, um, he <laughs> first he responded to all the reviews, but then he doubles down. And like the the two years later, he publishes another article. He's like, oh, I have another hop. Let me tell you about this. For it must be that first of all, I'm right. That originally it was the Christian sects that did this. But not only am I right, Shimon Hapikoli is really Shimon of Yush, is Simeon of uh Simon of Yushalayim. Now let me give you some background to what he's trying to say. First of all, Clearly, he believes in the Heinemann view of the various sects composing various uh, prayers in, in Eretz Yisrael in the early formation of prayer. So first of all, he believes that different prayer groups, prayer circles developed their own uh, free, they were free to develop their own types of prayers. But what he's trying to say is that this is this was a, a, a theory that was already proposed long before him, that this entire episode in the Gemara about Shimon Hapikoli reciting everything in front of him, Gamliel Biavne, is really much more particular. Shimon Hapikoli, in this view, is not to be sh identified as Shimon the flax worker. Shimon Hapikoli is really Shimon Kleofa, Kuf Lamed Yud Avav Pe Aleph. And in Greek, Kleofa or Picole would really be the same thing. It, it, it's the same last name. Kleopas and Picole would would was uh, Picolas would be would be exactly the same name, and that's why Shimon Hapicoli is not called Rabbi Shimon Hapicoli because Shimon Hapicoli, if you don't know, sorry, Shimon Cleo, Simon Cleopas, Simon the son of Cleopas, was the second bishop of Jerusalem. He was a Jew. He was the leader of the Jewish Christians in Yerushalayim in the second century. Now, as a Jew, he was also a prominent Jew, a very old, respected Chacham. And he led all the Jews, the Jewish Kehillah in Yushalayim that believed in Yeshu. Now, in their time, they didn't believe that, you know, Yeshu was God. They didn't believe that he was, uh, <clears throat> when, you know, the son of God or anything like that. They didn't have a, a sophisticated trilogy, uh, trinity uh, theology. They didn't have a sophisticated trinity theology that was developed. But and for the most part, they were just basically Jews. So as the one of the old respected rabbis in Yerushalayim, Rabbi Gamliel Biyamne called uh, Shimon Kleofas Kleofa before the Sanhedrin or his Sanhedrin to testify what was the old Nusuch because he was a reliable source. He was a reliable source for the old Nusuch. But when then now this is where it gets fun and you have to get into. Uh, Yehuda leaves his imagination. He imagines a story like this: Shimon Apikoli or Shimon Kleopas is summoned, uh, like as if he's like the Chabad rabbi, you know, the rabbi of the uh, not su not not such heretic clan, but like you know, he's he's the he, they're not heretics; they're just you know Jews who have fringe beliefs. So he, him as the he's called in as like a consultant. Rabbi Gamliel Biyavna doesn't like him. Rabbi Gamliel Biyavna brings him in as a consultant. He doesn't consider him a mean, but he brings him in as a consultant to the Sanhedrin to write, to, to testify the 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 earlier Nusach of Shimon Esrei, which predates Rabbi Gamliel and, Shim, and Shimon uh, Cleopas himself. In comes Shimon Cleopas and he recites all 18 brachot in their order. He says, this is the right order. This is how we did it during Bayesheni. Um, This is the way it should be done. And he, this is the Nusach. But then he says, Matzmiach Karen Yeshua. And Matzmiach Karen Yeshua is really just a nusach that he and his Christian friends invented in their own synagogue. 
So Rabbi Gamliel B'Yavna gets upset. And Rabbi Gamliel B'Yavna says, Okay, done with this guy. Does anybody else have uh, have a have a solution for how we could make a bracha for the heretics? Meaning, I don't trust you, Shimon, uh, Shimon Cleopas, to not be a heretic. Now I need my Sanhedrin, somebody who's not this guy, somebody please make me a bracha saminim. Essentially, that there's a reason why Shimon Piccoli is forgotten and not well known among the Jewish people, and that is because he was a Jewish Christian, not a regular Jew. Now, none of the academics, as far as I know, in the following journal, I, I didn't see the following journal, I should be honest, but I don't think anybody responded. I think they, they realized that at this point, he's just a troublemaker, and who the leaves is a troublemaker, and he wants to invent these stories, and they're not going to poke the bear. They're not going to, you know, continue to uh risk give give him the dignity of a response here to to entertain his imagination that this entire story that he's just weaved uh, uh is what happened you know and there and there Abna got upset and then he made them combine the bracha and tell the KW because he didn't like Matsmiach Karen Yeshua and he added Berchasaminim and you know this this whole thing and there was really the bracha was really written by the Jewish at least the Khatima was really written by Jewish Christians didn't like it. He did not not like it. Um, uh, sorry, they did not like it. I think most academics don't like this. Most serious scholars of liturgy don't like this. There's too much imagination involved, too many assumptions involved, and they wanted him to stay in his lane, do your Kabbalah thing, and stay out of stay out of trouble. So, if you ever see this claim brought up that Matzmiach Karen Yeshua was invented by Christian Jews, um, please know that it's forty years old. It is. It has been thoroughly debunked, or not not just debunked. I would say thoroughly um, rejected by most serious scholars of liturgy because there's just too many flaws in the methodology for this to be taken as a serious consideration. And what's Uriah? Because it says Yeshua and it doesn't say Lebet David. That's not enough. The the um, as as far as the Geniza evidence goes. The uniformity of this nusach, Masniach Karen Yeshua, and how ancient that is, that goes all the way back to Bavli, is further testimony that this is a real, normal way of speaking in Hebrew. And there was no fluidity in in exactly how this bracha was expressed. We don't have rayas that in Eretz Yisrael they ever said Masniach Karen Yeshua. It seems that this is a natively Bavel version, and most scholars seem to point towards Bavel for the composition of this. To it is possible that it was originally created in Eretz Yisrael, but all of our evidence points to Bavel. This is a bracha in Bavel created by, uh, by the sages of Bavel, the Amoraim, uh, for use as the end of the bracha of David here. With the only evidence we have is Magin David as a Khatima, that was from Rabbi Bar Shila. Perhaps some people used that version, but we don't have evidence that in Bavel they ever used Matzmiach Karen Lebet David. And nor do we find any grammatical difficulty with Matzmiach Karen Yeshua. It is interesting. Again, his problem still stands. Why would you not end with Eloke David or Magain David or something that says Matzmiach Karen Lebet David? Why not? Uh, we might never know. It could simply be, be because it's trying to mimic the Pesukim. Um, like Rama Karni Ba'ashem Rachav Pi Alevai V'Samachti B'Shuatecha. It could be. It could be it's just simply trying to paraphrase Pizukim, but we'll never know for sure. Another point I should I should leave you guys with uh, before we finish speaking tonight is uh, let's do two points. Number one, the Karaganiza, and number two, the reform sitters most recently. So the Karaganiza evidence is very definitive, right? In Eretz Yisrael, they did uh, one bracha, and Bavel they did two brachot. But we also have evidence from the Piu team. And in the PU team, almost none of the PU team will ever will ever have a PU for the fifteenth bracha because there was no fifteenth bracha. Essentially, there are no PU team in the in the Krovach uh, Yudchet in any Krova any PU assortment that was created for Shmona Esrei. We just don't have a poem written for the fifteenth bracha because there is no fifteenth bracha. Now, I believe it was the son of the of the Tosafot Rid who in a in a manuscript tshuva. He believed that perhaps it's possible that they really did say it, but I forgot his svarah. But he had a reason why they didn't want to, to 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 make poems for that bracham. It's it's slipping my mind right now. But that's probably not likely. 
there were, we do find some Pew team, later Pew team, where they've added a Pew for the 15th Baruch of Masmiach Karen Yeshua, but uh, our intuition tells us that these are later editions. Also, the evidence just from the, the language of the Pew team, it's most likely that those Krovot Yudchet were that have a 15th Krovah, 15th poem. Um, are, are amendments that were later added in order to fix it for people who are praying according to the Nusach Habavli instead of praying according to the Nusach HaYerushalmi. Lastly, the reform. And really, well, two. Two things to discuss. The reform and the Nusach Sfard. Of course, the famous, the, the Hasidim and the Reforma, you know, the two, the two reactions <laughs> to the nationalistic movement in modern Europe. Okay, so first the reform. Uh, this was one of the first brachos, besides kibbutz galiot, to be touched by the reform, because you see, the reform didn't necessarily believe in the whole the whole ancient Jewish eschatology. They had reservations about this whole physical conception of the messianic era that one day there will be a messiah. He will be embodied by a person, and he will come with his army, or he will come with the word of God, and make us repent and bring us back to a utopian vision of society. They didn't believe that the embodiment of the Messiah should be a physical embodiment, one fought by wars, one fought by a person, one brought in by the ushering of a prophet with the word of God. They believed that it was some utopian society which we could achieve by ourselves. The prophecies in the Bible could be fulfilled by us. We don't have to have a personal physical embodiment of Mashiach. Again, this is getting very close to the ancient Jewish Christian, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, controversies. But that was their position. So some of the reformed Sidurim, and not all, but some of them changed it as follows. Based on the Pasuk in Yirmiyah, they said, instead of saying at Tzemach David, they said, et Tzemach Tzedakam Heirat Hatzmiach, Vekano Tarum Kino Mecha, right? And and Vekaren and Yeshua Tarum Kino Mecha, and you should raise the horn of salvation as thou, thou hast spoken, Ki Lishuatcha Kivinu Kol Hayom, some of them just left out David. They would just say, I don't, uh, some will say, leaving out David as well. Now, I don't know what modern Sidurim do. I didn't get a second to check, but that was their reaction to it. They said, no, David Melech, David Melech HaMashiach. No, we don't like it. The Arizal, as an aside, holds that Vakisei David Avdecha is Mashiach ben Yosef, and Etzemach David Avdecha Meret HaSmiach is Mashiach ben David. Famously, I think it was Rav Gon who said, we don't have to have both. We don't have to have both Mashiachs. If you're interested in the theology of this, I would recommend looking at Rav Sadia Gaon. He believes that it's possible for us to just have a Mashiach, but David, and we don't have to have a Mashiach ben Yosef. If you're familiar with Jewish eschatology, you would know that, that Mashiach ben Yosef is supposed to be a precursor Messiah who comes to, if necessary, fight battles for the Jewish people at the end of days. Um... And lastly, this is a rumor I've heard about the Nusach Sfarad. The Nusach Sfarad, um, and I hope I can pull it up here quickly enough, says, we go to Liturgy, Siddur Sfarad. We're going to open up the Amidah. Let me scroll down here for you. Et Tzemach David, right here. Let me Let me share my screen with you. I hope that I could corroborate this one day, and I hope I could get back to everybody and corroborate this. But let's look at this Hasidish Nosach. As Semach David Avdecha Meher Tatsmiach, the Karnai Torah Bishua Secha, Kilishua Kivinu Kol Hayim. Right? The first part, very simple. But then there's this addition here, Umitzapim Lishua. Let me tell you right now, no medieval sitter ever, ever, ever said Umitzapim Lishua. That just didn't exist. So they added this right here in the Hasidish Sidurim. A rumor I heard was, and I haven't seen it in the Siddur myself, was that originally Umetzapim Lishua was in parentheses. And people started saying it, thinking that it was an alternate Nusach. However, what it actually was, was a Kabbalistic instruction. You see, the Arizal holds that at this part, I think it's the Arizal, I could be wrong, I'll have to go look that up in my older notes. But the Arizal holds that at this bracha, you're supposed to stop and you're supposed to meditate on the, uh, you're supposed to meditate on the Yeshua. You're supposed to feel a hope. You're supposed to yearn for the Geula, uh, 
for the Geula of Mashiach. And so because the Hasidim were very into the Kabbalah, they believed that you should stop here, right? In, parent in parentheses, they put, Umetzapim Lishua, right? You stop here and you meditate you uh, and you think about the uh, the Yeshua that's supposed to come at the end of days. That, that, In other words, it was a Kabbalistic instruction that was put into parentheses over here. And essentially what happened was that by accident, people began saying, Umetzapim Lishua, thinking that it wasn't an instruction, it was instead a part of the Nusach. It's funny. It's almost like uh, this is an old joke among Jewish people that when you have these people that we call uh, twice a year Jews, or I mean, it's it's not, it's sort of pejorative. I, I shouldn't really say it, but people who don't come to shul often or people who speak, who can read Hebrew, but they can't understand Hebrew, it's very common and very comedical that they will sometimes read the Siddur cover to cover. Like they'll read the, the entire Shemot Esrei with all the instructions in between. If the instructions are written in Hebrew, what do they know? They just read the Hebrew too because they don't know what it means. So they'll just read the instructions as well. So this would be funny if true. I don't know if it is true. Uh, and I I really should have. I, I wish I had the time. Unfortunately, going through <laughs> going through the length of that controversy about Jewish Christians took up most of my time. I'm sorry. I wish I had time to investigate this this claim about the Hasidic davening. I think it's true um, that it used that it used to be in in parentheses, and I, I'm pretty sure that 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 this sounds suspiciously accurate. But I do know there was no medieval nusach of Mitzapim Lishua, and it's definitely a modern edition of Hasidic Hasidurim. So whether or not it is a mistaken instruction or not, I can't tell you. I think it's true. Um, but to verify, I would have to pour through roughly 15 Hasidish Yisudurim. I just didn't have the time this week. So if you do have time and this does interest you, please open up the Eitzar HaChachma, look up the, the uh, what's it called, the Eitzar HaTfilais, and I'm sure you'll find the answers that you are seeking. Okay, so, and if anybody has any questions, please get in touch with me on Spotify. And I know there's a chat on Spotify, on uh, uh, maybe YouTube comments, whatever you want, or email me. And if there's a topic in this year that interests you, please don't hesitate to look it up. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating things in regards uh, to Etzemach David Meirat Atzmiach. So thank you to everybody for your time and attention. I think next week is Erev, Wednesday is Erev Rosh Hashanah, so there won't be a shiur. But we will continue the following Wednesday night, if possible. It's not, yeah, the Yom Kippur is on a Shabbat. And perhaps we will... I hope to see you all next week. So thank you for your time and attention and I'll see you all next time.